What is up, down and sideways, you absolutely glorious individuals? Welcome to another epi of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you guys. We're a little late to the party, but today we're going looking back. Season 2, Arcane. Full thoughts, full review of the whole thing. If you still haven't watched it, this is your forewarning to get the hell out of here. Because, of course, we're going to be spoiling uh, throughout the whole thing. And first and foremost, listen. This is the only show with multiple seasons that's got above a 9 on every single episode on IMDb. Like, one of the highest top-rated Rotten Tomatoes shows of all time. But that doesn't mean people didn't find things to be a little grumpy about. And the number one thing I've seen is, of course, to do with the pacing. And I get, especially Act 3, happens really quickly. It's a quick turnaround and everything. People wanted more time for things to develop. Maybe even wanting a Season 3. That is what a lot of people were wanting at the end of the day. The appetite for this story, these characters, the arcs that they were going to be on, the setting, the location, and what we would see in both Piltover and Zahn as they evolved in the course of this conflict. A lot of people thought that they wanted a little bit more, but that's not the way that things are going to go. And we can talk about the pros and cons of that situation because you better believe, yes, there's both. There is both the pros and the cons of moving on from Arcane at this point in time after season two and to cut it the way that it was in this time frame, the um, episodes that they did have, the amount of work that would go into these episodes, everything else. I don't see any way that you really could be continuing this one on or, or that it would be the right path forward for League of Legends to continue sticking with this arcane project. Yeah, we know we're, they're already working on the next project. We know the budget was north of $200 million, uh, which is, you know, not that insane compared to other huge Hollywood budgets uh, yes. for movies. But I guarantee you if there was a third season... People would have been saying, it's too slow. It's dragging on. There's too many filler episodes because that's the nature of things. But I'm going to go a different way and kind of defend the fast pacing. I think we got to look at it not like a traditional TV show because this was a stylistic way for them to show off their insane animations. How many times do they demonstrate a passage of time, whether it's Jinx walking through Zon, so you kind of see what she's been up to for these time jumps, and they condense that into like a five minute scene. But they do it with these incredible, stylistically uh, and aesthetically pleasing, totally different art styles to kind of tell that story in a condensed form. It's almost like a comic book. For, I think that's a really good uh, reference to go back to is that kind of comic book type of thing where, again, not every panel in the comic book is picking up exactly after the previous panel. Sometimes you're having those jumps and these type of things. And with Arcane, it really is, did you want it to be fully fleshed out in the way that I think a, a couple people are talking about in the pacing and where they want it slowed down, what type of stories and emotions they wanted to see told through it? Well, you're going to be there for another five seasons, I think, if we're doing it like that, to get to the point that we're at where we're finishing with season two. So in order to hit a couple of these notes, get these big moments, build the story the way that they wanted to here, you had to do this type of pacing. So I can see I can see both sides of it, because I think at the end of the day, it does feel a, a bit rushed, and especially a bit rushed in comparison to season one, I think is the where you have that anchor point for this series and how its pacing was going through, where we were progressing through these stories, through the arcs of the characters, changes in season two and goes into a bit more of a rapid fire as we go from act one to act two to act three, especially in that third act to wrap uh, as much of it as they could up in the conclusion. And, of course, that's mainly because the story gets so much grander, right, in this whole season two. Season one's relatively simple, telling the story of Silco and, you know, Violet and Powder when they're younger. And then all of a sudden, season two, you've got multiverses, different dimensions, guys going into totally different, like, it's such a bigger story to be telling. Uh, and, obviously, harder to do uh, in that long doubt. But when it is condensed, it's, it's still obviously fantastic across the board. And we got to give a big shout out. You know, say what you will about Riot. But how they have weaved this into every crack of every platform. TFT has an entire set around it. All these different skins are implemented. And now the battle passes. And we'll get to what's after Arcane. But we can see already 2025, the season, like Arcane is going to live on. 
it really has been this new breath of life for League of Legends. I feel like the way that this series has come through and grabbed people that are outside of the realm of League of Legends, and I mean outside the realm of just playing the game, not even, you know, talking about the, the other part of the community like us, where we're involved with esports and the competitive side and everything else, that far bigger, broader reaching approach that Arcane has been able to capture for the game has been wonderful. And yes, the way that they have handled this property and supported it through the rest of this ecosystem within Riot Games and League of Legends has been something I think is really special. I'm worried because I feel like there's going to be a lot of voices in the Valorant community at some point asking for something along those lines, something similar, take away a little bit of the steam, a little bit of the spotlight from League of Legends on that one. And if you're Riot Games and you've seen the success that you've had handling this one for League of Legends, I don't know why you don't think that you want to apply this to another one of your properties, but for me, a little selfishly, I think we've still got too many great stories in League of Legends that need to be hit on first. Obviously, the lore is a lot older for League of Legends. It's just been around a lot longer, even though I know, especially post-Arcane, a lot of them have been seriously retconned to just yeah. fully be what it is in Arcane. But they're just building up for that Valorant League of Legends crossover King Kong oh. Godzilla movie that's going to be, you know... 20 years from now, uh, at this pace, things will happen. But uh, yeah, absolutely done a good job bridging all the games together and making this a full universe. You can even find Arcane in the client itself. They're pushing you to it. So a masterclass in doing that. Let's go through these main actual arcs. You know, there's multiple different plot lines that happen uh, throughout Season 2. Start with what we'll call the main, main characters. That is this by Jinx, Caitlyn... Uh, kind of trio and this I think the one thing that you maybe get if things were paced out a little bit uh, slower is maybe seeing the growth of Caitlyn and her becoming you know crazy dictator Caitlyn that probably not many people expected it to switch like that but I think even showing you know her using these tunnels that her family used for ventilation to basically gas out all of Zahn that to me is kind of the transition point to her becoming that it, it felt like a, a snap to some people, right? But I think a lot of people knowing Caitlyn and the vibe that she puts out, this is where we're headed towards as far as being in Piltover and that type of control dictatorship that we know that the the sharpshooter of Piltover will want to put into act. And we saw that in, in Arcane. I think for me, it was all about with those three characters, I feel like the pacing was about as good as it could be. Maybe if you wanted to flesh out a couple of the emotions behind some of the decisions, some of the choices that go through, you could have a couple more scenes. But overall, I think their story got the type of treatment that it deserved and brings in the type of attention, the adoration, the fandom that they were looking for with these characters. And I think this arc especially is a testament to the writing in this show because you have... Somebody like Jinx, who you look at all that she does in the show, and you're like, why would anyone be rooting for this girl? <laughs> She's just murdering people. Uh, but they, you're writing a complex villain that isn't just so many... There's so many villain tropes in films where it's just me bad, me kill people, and there's no... There's no depth to any of these characters, but obviously someone like Jinx is incredibly deep with the tragedy that she's gone through, and so many times, especially in season two, you see a moment where you're like, she's gonna come back, she's gonna help people, and I mean, she kinda does uh, towards the end. But there's multiple times you see that redemption and then it gets snatched away at the last second. I was, you know, I, I watched this with my parents and they're watching and they're kind of going like, you know, what, what is, you know, this, this Jinx girl, right? Because they know, you know, talking about it and, and everything with pro play, they know that she's a big character or one that's been involved for all these times. They go, why do people actually like her? Why are we rooting for this girl? <laughs> she screws everything up everything goes wrong whether it's her fault or not it's always messing up with jinx and then through the course of the show again they see the story they understand the heart behind her as a character where what she's actually responsible for and what is you know a reasonable possible outcome given the scenarios the situations all the influences around it and everything else it is a wonderful story and i think that her as a a front headline character has been very good for this one. I think Vi has, of course, been 
the very forefront of the jungle meta for quite a, a while now, so we've seen a healthy dosage of her through the uh, lifetime of Arcane. Uh, <laughs> maybe. And hey, who knows with the, the Arcane changes coming for Caitlyn too. Could see that one popping up in this next year. Caitlyn mid lane coming to you uh, no. soon. <laughs> Fit them uh, whatever way you can so they can both uh be on the same squad but um you know big shout out to ella purnell who does the voice for jinx from fallout by the way if anyone watched fallout but the voice acting on jinx all the characters are fantastic the voice actors but jinx in particular when she's absolutely losing her mind is incredible and i'm telling you right now if you're responsible for any type of video game adaptation you better be calling her because she is clearly someone that vibes with the community, that understands the pieces of art, what you can gain and value from these universes, these characters, these stories, and is able to passionately bring it and translate that, whether that's on the screen with something like the Fallout series or with the voice acting behind with something like Arcane here. That's it. That's she's she's instantly one of my superstars coming out of this series, whether that's the character Jinx or the voice behind it. Attached to these three, obviously, is the whole Ambessa, Mel, Black Rose storyline. They're all interweaved. And this is really the only arc that was a bit confusing just because there's already so much going on. But then there's the whole, okay, Mel's like not actually the daughter. She's an adopted daughter. Black Thor, I this is obviously to set up what's next in the universe. That's the whole point of this storyline. But to me, this is the only arc that gets a little convoluted because there's so much else going on. And I think part of that is because the series has done such a good job of doing that explanation, doing the, you know, uh, what you need to fully grasp. Okay, this is this part in the lore. This is where this fits in and all these things within the story. And then in comes that influence, the Ambisa influence, Noxus Mel, you know, all these type of things, the Black Rose and where you fit that story in and the secrecy that is inherent to that story, to that society, to how it influences in. That was one of those things where you had to keep that buried. You couldn't go full explanation mode all the time and reveal all the cards. And that's where you feel a little uh, left in the dark with some of these ones and kind of going, oh, that kind of came out of nowhere. Okay. But I feel like a lot maybe of the stuff we have questions for will be answered eventually in five years when there's, you know, another <laughs> series to be looking at. Obviously, the most insane story has got to go to Mr. Jace and Victor because, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're hopping into new dimensions. I don't even know where we're ending up. But what I kind of loved is you compare these two with, you know, the whole Singed and Warwick thing. Singed makes this monster. There's parallels because Jace made Victor. He made this monster by, you know, trying to save his life. It came from good intentions. But he, if he had just, you know, perished as intended during that explosion, we wouldn't have this insane robot alien hive mind Victor. Which, yes, we say goodbye to a good old cyborg Mr. Robot Mechanical Victor and welcome in this new Hextech voided alien. Our overlord, Victor. yes. Praise be. Yes, well, welcome on in, Mr. Jesus Victor, <laughs> onto the scene. Jason Victor's story, I thought, was really one that caught me surprised and one that I wasn't expecting to take as many turns as it did, as wildly as it did, and work so wonderfully as it did. I think that this was a beautiful story that they were able to tell about these two, uh, you know, uh, very different ideas and approaches to things, but still that friendship, that partnership that existed between them throughout many different timelines, many different universes, whatever it ends up being. I think that they handled that very well. And for a character like Jace, who came into this series as kind of, oh, he's, you know, uh, I don't know about everybody else. I'm only thinking debonair Jace. I'm thinking Mr. Spiffy, Mr. I don't get dirty. I'm the king pin of Mr. Piltover. But here we go. We get to see a battle tested, hardened, war tested throughout and uh, seeing all the horrors and atrocities of this technology. And here he comes at the end of it through. And he got one hell of an upgrade in his big time arcane skin. I'll say that one too. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely probably the sickest arcade skin uh, from the recalls and death animations and everything. But I love seeing, uh, you know, after Act 2, Jace comes in and blows up Victor and everyone's like, oh my God, Jace is the bad guy. Why is he doing that? Blah, blah, blah. And then you, you think, you know, this guy went through some stuff. And then, of course, they show his, <laughs> whew, goes through the absolute hell 
that is that arcade landscape. So, uh, yeah, our boy Jace has been through some stuff. But this is, again, similar to where, you know, Vi is constantly forgiving and helping Jace no matter what she's done. At the end, Jace is there to put his hand on Victor's shoulder, even though this dude is literally trying to take over all of humanity. I, I do a while pretty crazy at, at, at the end of that all to see that the way it comes through but i still liked you know uh, the uh, definitive conviction that he did have all the way through this second season i think that was a big one where he you know kind of was almost like just a, an excited puppy in the first season is the way you looked at jace and how he approached hex tech and everything else and then here comes season two jace Faced with the consequences, faced with reality of some of these choices, of some of your hopes and dreams, and how you need to handle it, and what is that possible flip side of the coin shown through his trip through hell of Arcane, he's come through and he knows exactly what action needs to be taken. And he fully takes control. Everyone listens to him when he's like, stop your petty squabbles. We're all going to die to aliens unless we get together. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Jace. I guess uh, that's where we're headed going forward. What we thought were side characters and were side characters for the majority of the show. We're talking Heimerdinger and Echo, but maybe my favorite arc is when they actually get to, you know, stand on their own and have the scenes to themselves. When they go to this alternate dimension where powder stays powder, everything's lovey-dovey, and Echo obviously figures out uh, his whole Z-Drive thing. But that whole little mini arc was maybe one of the best parts of the entire show for me. I had a lot riding on how they were going to handle Echo because Echo was one of my one of the first characters that I ever fell in love with in the game of League of Legends. One of the ones that excited and enticed me to even play the game in the first place. My very first pentakill coming on the boy wonder. You love to see it and we got him in his prime in this show. They did it well. They did the whole story arcs well, the involving of, you know, just the attitude and the character that he has and, and how he interacts with everybody. The whole creating of the Z drive and fleshing out that story and getting to see it animated. Love to see that. And yes, the maturity, the growth, the hero moment to turn away from what was that perfect timeline and realize I need to save my own. I need to be the one that takes this action that puts on, you know, everybody on my back. I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the boy wonder who saves time. Yes, sir. That is my guy echo. He, he has hero moments, plural. First, he does that whole process to go back. He saves Jake's life in his timeline, what, like four or five times. Stops her from doing the grenade jump. And then he's saving almost all of Piltover by rewinding that time, cranking it even further before Victor fully takes over. And then he's coming in with Jinx to save Piltover from Ambessa and the Noxians. So this dude is a hero like four times in the last episode. I'm going to throw it out there because I saw it. It was in interesting from LS talking about maybe, you know, you could do a couple of arcane kind of tweaks, little reworks here to Echo's kit. What about changing the way that he's using that Z drive for that R, the ultimate ability? You can do kind of like a, a quick tap one where he's going back that standard four seconds in time, does the damage and everything else. What if we make it that you can maybe hold it down for a couple seconds longer and all of a sudden he's going back eight seconds in time. He's going back even further. There's a bigger damage around him. And you know what? The cost of it, because again, we know how everything has worked. It's going to deal some damage to himself too. So you got to be careful about these ones. I think that's an interesting idea. And I just wanted to throw it out there because again, these are the type of things, the creativity that can come through when you see stuff fleshed out the way that it was in Arcane and see these big moments. And again, one last one. A shout out to your boy Heimer because he deserves he now. had the hero moment he had to sacrifice I know Yordles come back in some type of way right that's my understanding of the lore they don't ever truly die but still gotta appreciate the hero sacrifice from him to make it all happen and the musical performance out of oh. our boy Heimer on the I don't know electro cyberpunk banjo whatever that was uh, what, what a difference to what, what he was vibing and jamming out and grooving out to. And then meanwhile, we got Victor. Not, not Victor, excuse me, Jace, going through what Jace is going through. Yeah, that, that's not the soundtrack for what Jace was going through. <laughs> <laughs> Upside down arcade. So obviously, the show wraps up rapid quick. Uh, and we get just the little teaser to what we already know, especially with now 2025. Literally changing the whole map to be Noxus in League of Legends. Seems like Mel is going to be that main character, as or at least 
a featured character as the new whatever general emperor of Noxus. That seems like where the setting's going to be, which does open up a whole lot of new characters. The main, obviously, Swain gets teased as that uh, Three-Eyed Raven coming in. Shout out to Game of Thrones as well for the Three-Eyed Raven. Uh, but you know it's going to be Noxus and the Ionian War, which means Irelia, Lee Sin, Ari, Karma, Zed, all the ninjas, all potential to be in this new series. My, my question is, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if it is fully going towards Ionia. I think that that is obviously one of the main options that is there and one of the most enticing ones. Zed, Shen, Akali, Aurelia, hey, Ari. You Yasuo, a Yasuo skin, a new one. Come on. Oh. All that would go so hard, but I'm also opening the door for what about Demacia? Because we know yeah. that Noxus is also at war with that region. They just like the war with everybody, huh? <laughs> and you can't tell me the way that they've seen success with Jinx, with Vi. You don't want to throw in some OGs like Mr. Garen, Lux in the mid lane? You can't tell me we can't have a... We had an epic, manly moment for Mr. Jace. You can't tell me you can't have that for Silas. Yeah. Come on. I, I, I mean, Garen basically just Jace with bigger shoulder pads and bigger armor, you know? <laughs> I would love to see that would that's the angle that I want to see is kind of that Demacia one. I've thrown it out there before so many other times that I still want to see a whole separate one. I want to go to Sharima. Give me my my Azir Emperor of the Sands, uh Renekton Nasus type of drama. I want to see that one. But I think where we're going, Noxus, of course, Swain's gonna be there, Darius is gonna be there. My big one is about Mel and how she's gonna interact with the Black Rose with LeBlanc, as we all know, because of course, in the scenes where she's involved in it. So much of that imagery, so much of that magic looks to be LeBlanc's magic. And we know, you know, she's got all the clones. She's always in the shadows, everything else. But we got to get some look at her. And I think that that would be a, a big moment for the League community. Yeah, it definitely feels like she could be the overarching big bad on top of, you know, whatever war Noxus is waging. But the point is, they've got options in terms of where they go and spread from the Noxian Empire. They can include all kinds of different options. Uh, armies who knows when it's going to come out but you know again already season 15 crazy we're at that season full noxus theme you know that that's where things are heading and we personally cannot wait for any more content to be coming out but that is it today for league unlock eric and mark here with you beautiful people thanks for hanging out and we will catch you on that flippity flip